So next up, Sam Glassenberg. Uh, he will speak for himself, as he is a, a very apt to do. Um, but uh, I don't know if he'll share his personal story of extraordinary success. His parents really just wanted him to be a doctor, and they, they still just want him to be a doctor. But somehow he got into video games. Uh, I don't know if that resonates with any of the parents in the room. There is a career. There is a future in video games, it turns out. Uh, Sam Glassenberg. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Sam. Uh, oh, I don't have this microphone. I'm Mike. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Um, I'm not going to do any live demos unless you want. I can do the colonoscopy on stage if you want. No, no, we've done that. All right, we've done yeah. that before. Yes. The knee yeah. surgery? No, yes. all right. I'm Fine. still hurting from that. So yes, you're keep welcome. Going. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> um, all right, so as we continue to ask ourselves what Gen AI means for our industries as employees, as engineers, as a workforce, as artists, as we talked about yesterday, as marketers, I'm happy to share. Um, you know, we're asking all these questions like, what does Gen AI mean? There's an industry that has answered it for us. It's the video games industry. You're welcome. Um, all right, a little bit, we'll frame it a little bit better. So there's a, the video games industry has embraced generative AI wholeheartedly. It's nice and cool. And provides lessons, both promising and warning, that are directly applicable to other industries. The examples I'm going to give you today are in healthcare, but extend it to your own. Um, and so the video games industry provides us with a model both of how to approach and how to leverage generative AI. Instead of viewing generative AI as a threat, the video games industry, all the employees, artists, engineers, overwhelmingly view it as a healthy and welcome evolution of basically three decades of innovation. Um, and putting fear aside, the video games industry is using Gen AI in ways that are directly applicable, for example, to healthcare and other industries, both in terms of how we train AI as well as how we use it. Um, first, a little bit about me and sort of how that's relevant. So I live at the intersection of video games and medicine. I run a company called Level X that uses video game technology and the neuroscience of video games to basically accelerate the adoption curve of new products in healthcare. Uh, we have about a million medical professionals playing our games. Uh, we were acquired three years ago, so I'm not raising money. I'm not actually even selling anything here. Um, we work with all the major medical device, life science companies. Uh, we work with NASA, actually thanks to Twin. That introduction happened here. Thank you, Rob. Um, and uh, we actually have a game launching next month on the Polaris Dawn SpaceX mission, because, you know, it's June. Um, but to be clear, I don't sell any AI products. This is not a level X pitch. I don't sell any AI products. I am a beneficiary of generative AI. We've learned a lot of lessons in terms of applying video game Gen AI techniques in healthcare that are relevant in other industries. So I'm here to share the learnings. Um, so like I said, while most industries are viewing Gen AI with fear and trepidation, the games industry is proving to be basically an exemplar. Um, I'll show you why. So a little bit about me. Before Level X, I used to run um, a video game technology team at Microsoft. I uh, used to fly spaceships for Star Wars games at LucasArts. And I'll tell you a little bit about my team's job at Microsoft. So, you know, Rob talked about the Moore's Law Curve. In the video games industry, we don't show the Moore's Law Curve as a graph. We just show it in pictures. You can cheer for any games you've played. Uh, this is the best-looking video game character in 1989. And basically, we just grab onto the curve, and we don't let go. Um, so basically, every few years, we're, you know, games keep looking better and better. This was the best-looking video game character when I joined Microsoft in 2001. Looks human, but very computer generated. And my team's job was to figure out how do we go from this to this. Um, so my team DirectX, like our team's job was to figure out how do we make video games look real. So Call of Duty, I can zoom into the eye of one of the characters. This is the level of detail we're creating video game characters and call it last generation video games. Um, uh, my team, um, on behalf of my team, I accepted a technical Emmy for this work. That's me, that's Jensen accepting his Emmy on behalf of NVIDIA um, for pushing the cutting edge of interactive graphics. It's the technical Emmys. It's not the one they show on TV. But the bottom line is, like, this is, this is what NVIDIA and Microsoft were doing before the AI revolution. And thanks to Moore's Law, every five years, video game hardware supports an order of magnitude more content and an order of magnitude more detail which sounds cool, but it creates a huge problem, which is the game's price basically stays the same. 
So what that means is the only solution is to make your artists and your engineers basically 100x more productive. You cannot make, you cannot make this using the tools that you use to make this you know, from five years ago. So imagine we're in Chicago. Imagine you're trying to recreate the entire city of Chicago. You're making watchdogs. You want to model it down to you know, the soda can rolling on the ground. You cannot do this by hand. Um, you cannot, in every generation, the video games industry figures out how to make its artists and designers an order of magnitude more productive. So going from drawing pixels to basically modeling with virtual clay, um, but even these tools, you can't create a city this way, it'll take you too long. So what we do is we create these procedural tools, we use math modeled off the previous generation of tools to create complex variations and to automatically place elements. Um, and it's the output of these last generation mathematical tools that we're using to train the next generation of Gen AI based tools for the next round of video games. And I'll explain, you'll, you'll see how that works. Um, so, but the fundamental idea is if you're a video game artist, if you're doing the same thing you were doing five years ago, there's something wrong. Every five years, whatever you were doing five years ago, it's been automated, right? Now you're moving up the stack. So in the last generation, we perfected procedural content generation. So an artist can just, you know, drag lines, draw a street. It'll just fill in the city for you. Um, an artist can move a mountain. Like here I have this forest scene. We've, you know, you create, you literally grab that mountain, you drag it, and math will automatically fill in the details. Um, this is the expectation of everyone in the video games industry. Every five years, your work is completely different. Um, so at level X, we're using these same called mathematical procedural techniques to create content to train doctors. So in this, in this example, we have a mathematical procedural model for plaque psoriasis. So an artist can sit there with a dermatologist over her shoulder and they go, all right, make that a little crustier, make that redder in the crevice, uh, you know, make that um, wetter, change the cracking pattern, and it just generates infinite ultra-realistic images of plaque psoriasis. You'll notice actually it's, uh, we call it visual scripting, it's the same thing that Uncork was just showing you. Same, some of the same techniques. We've been using these in video games uh, for about 15 years, but like I said, video games were, were, were ahead. Um, and so here we, we can, for example, use this technology with dermatology clients to train doctors' brains how to diagnose and treat a huge range of skin diseases you know, on any, at any severity, um, on any body part, uh, on skin of any color. And so these images I'm showing you, they're not real. These are all just procedurally generated images generated by our engine mathematically. Um, and so those are you know, sort of visual examples with skin. We use the same mathematical procedural techniques to model body movement. Um, for example, in neurology, mathematical models that will allow an artist to overlay a tremor at any frequency or amplitude on any body part um, or any body type to train neurologists how to, let's say, recognize the difference between a Parkinsonian tremor and a tardive dyskinesia tremor. And it's this mathematically, procedurally generated content that we're using to train as the input data our next-gen AI systems. So this is an example of AI-generated real-time character animation trained on procedural data. This is what your video game characters are gonna look like end of this year, maybe definitely holiday 2026. Um, and of course, we get to use these Gen AI methods to create better training data to train doctors. Uh, but this idea has much broader implications besides just training doctors. Uh, so I'm not gonna do the colonoscopy live, um, but we can use the last generation's procedural methods, the mathematical methods, to create synthetic data that we can use to create smarter AI systems. So this is like our gastroenterology game, I've demoed it or um, since we're generating these images procedurally, we know where everything is. So we know the position of the camera, we know which devices you're using, we know the physiology of the patient, we know the lighting, we know everything. And so we can use this data, this artificial data, to train smarter AI systems. Systems that know exactly where you are in the procedure and exactly what's happening. So just like in games, we're using the last generation's procedural mathematical content to train our new AI systems. In healthcare, you can use the same approach to train, let's say, smart medical devices. So instead of you know, trying to train AI systems in healthcare by taking lots of surgical videos and just tagging them, 
Usually you get them tagged by people in India. The results aren't that great. Um, now you can determine the data that you want and the tags that you want and generate it procedurally and automatically generate what it looks like under x-ray, under ultrasound, whatever. So we can train smarter, unbiased AI systems that know how to find cancer on skin of color, right, as opposed to lots of AI systems we've seen that can't or, or interpret ultrasound. Which brings me to sort of the next overlooked application of Gen AI in, in call it an R&D, um, which is in pure engineering. So there's this misperception that Gen AI's current value is replacing the engineering grunt work. This idea that like, all right, the, like, the code I was already going to outsource to East Asia, the easy, like the easy stuff that I was going to out, the simple programming task that Gen AI is going to handle. And that's probably going to happen, but I actually think that's less interesting. What we found is that if you pair them up with your smart engineers, Gen AI allows you to solve your hardest technical problems in orders of magnitude less time. Um, so I apologize. I'm going to have to skip over a ton of technical detail here. Happy to go over it later over drinks. Um, but basically, simulating light bouncing around a scene is incredibly complex, and it's incredibly compute intensive. But it's critical for complex materials like skin. If you ever held your hand up to a flashlight, Bounce, like light bounces around, it doesn't just reflect. Um, and this is why older movies um, that had a lot less compute power to work with, more longer, uh, their characters looked like plastic, but the movies of today, the characters look real. In games, the problem's even harder because in movies, we have hours to generate each frame. In games, we have to generate 60 frames a second. Same thing with surgical simulation. Um, so in the 2000s, around the time we came out with the Xbox 360 at Microsoft, Microsoft research was tasked with figuring out how to do smooth real-time shadows, uh, subsurface scattering, light bouncing, and make it so it could work on Xbox 360. They just they came up with this crazy way to do it. They called it pre-computed radiance transfer with spherical harmonics. I'm not going to go into the details. The one thing to just know, the math behind this is literally shared with quantum mechanics. Very complex. Um, but conveniently, we make games for phones. Um, and conveniently, like your phone has more compute power than the Xbox 360. So I wanted to use this technique for our patient's skin in our games. Um, but I calculated it would probably take us about six months of work to get this method up and running. Um, with ChatGPT, I did it in a weekend. And here are some highlights. Uh, hey, ChatGPT, write me a script to or rotate a sixth order spherical harmonic vector. ChatGPT goes, well, Second order spherical harmonic vector, that's easy. But a sixth order is a complex task that requires a deep understanding of spherical harmonics and their mathematical representation. Shut up, ChatGPT, and just do it. OK, here's the math. But if you want to actually use this math, you need to compute the Wigner D matrix. And that's also really hard. ChatGPT, you have a Mathematica plugin. Just use it. And with a little coaxing, done. Right? It generates all the math and the code for you. In a matter of hours, the system that I taught would take, thought would take six months is up and running on real patient data. Uh, and then the weekend after, which had to be developing novel methods for simulating bone drilling that can run on an iPhone. Right? So the important thing to think about is not just, oh, what's the code that, like, what are the sort of mid-level engineers that I can replace? What are those really hard problems? The ones that your CTO put in the filing cabinet because they're like, ah, oh, it's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to take months, years to develop. We may not actually solve this problem. Start pulling those problems out because now there's a new tool set and your top engineers can attack those um, and potentially solve them. Um, at Level X, we create a ton of training content for medical professionals. A lot of that you know, is like crazy simulated surgery, and some of it's knowledge questions, like knowledge about clinical study data, knowledge about whatever medical topics. Um, and it, what we've, in order to be effective, the content needs to be really, really good. I give whole talks about the neuroscience of creating good content to drive retention, techniques like mnemonics, combinatorics, anchoring. It, it's not, it gets very sophisticated. It's not like quantum mechanics sophisticated, but it gets sophisticated. Um, and when we started handing this work over to ChatGPT, uh, the results were mind-blowing, uh, a little bit too mind-blowing. And this is one of the warnings. Um, so herein lies one of the major problems with LLMs. 
So, hey, ChatGPT, can you come up with a multiple choice question that combines cultural references with dermatology knowledge that a dermatologist would find intriguing and challenging? Sure, here's a question. Which iconic singer was known for their distinctive mole on their face, which is actually a type of benign tumor called a neurofibroma? Marilyn Monroe, Cher, Madonna. Wow. This is interesting. It's deeply medical. It combines cultural references. Whoa. Everything in red, medically incorrect. Why? Because ChatGPT is optimized for believability over accuracy. And so um, there's a whole process that we go through to optimize this and to make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, but essentially, the challenge is ChatGPT will generate content with full confidence that a human writer would never say uh, with confidence. And, and because the people who trained it don't really have a background in medicine, they could tell whether the result was realistic, but not whether it was accurate. Um, and so again, at all, we talk about you know crap in, crap out. It's all about you know, the quality of the training data, and that's why things like synthetic data can help solve that problem. Um, the last example I'll use of applications of Gen AI in healthcare, I think, is the most important one. Um, and that is that I am thrilled to officially pronounce uh, the death of cheesy medical stock photography. Uh, you know the problem. Uh, on this website, he's a colorectal surgeon. On this website, he's a dermatologist. I gave this presentation at an FDA event in Korea. They also have the same problem. Um, no, no, there's no excuse for this anymore. Uh, my hope, uh, you know, a few months from now, that should be gone. Now with generative AI, we can generate any image of any doctor uh, doing anything we want in any visual style. Um, these are actually the results of older versions of mid-journey and stable diffusion. The results are even better today. Um, so, look, we don't know where all of this generative AI is going to lead us. I'm sure we'll talk about this later today whether it leads us to that apocalyptic future uh, that you know, we've seen in movies, um, or the utopian future where AI doesn't just solve our you know, spherical harmonics problems, um, but also solves our, um, helps us get to Mars, or you know, helps us solve all sorts of societal problems, not just racial disparities in healthcare, um, but energy challenges and other things. Um, I think the, the best way that we can influence which direction we go um, is making sure that the good people, the altruists, um, are the people, the people that have dedicated their lives to things like healthcare and otherwise, are the ones using it. Um, because the bad actors we know are using this stuff. And so if the good people have all the trepidation and anxiety and don't use it because they're worried about the possibilities, then this will arc in the wrong direction. Um, if we're incapacitated by our existential angst, like, well, we're not going to be able to slow this down. Um, and the bad actors are going to use it. So if, the, if we're going to arc it in the right direction, the best thing that we can do is make sure that the people, it's not just the video games folks, but the people in healthcare and the people working on all sorts of altruistic missions in the world are applying this. Uh, you feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. I'm always posting about interesting stuff at the intersection of AI, video games, healthcare, whatnot. Um, thank you very much. Right on time, Rob. You thought I had too many slides. What's uh -oh. one thing you've seen in the past year in this whole realm? AI, video games, anything that has... It has surprised me? I am constantly surprised. Okay. I mean, what, I, uh, huh? I mean, I thought this was pretty surprising. You mean surprising good or surprising bad? Either one, up to you. No, I mean, I think I have been... Oh, boy. Um, that's surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, like, it's just constant. The degree to which, I mean, this is an example. Um, the degree to which, uh, oh, I'll give you another example. Um, I sat down, so we were showing all those engineering techniques of, like, coming up with novel techniques and new ideas. Um, at one point, I was like, oh, you know, we've been under a lot of pressure from our parent company to, you know, file more patents because we're coming up with all this innovative stuff. Engineers don't like to file patents, so they push back on it. Um, I sat down with ChatGPT for 45 minutes, full 50-page patent application with diagrams. Like, I am just constantly being shocked at how effective this stuff is um, and all sorts of interesting applications you can use it for I hadn't thought of. Good answer, Valia? Great answer. Thanks, okay. Sam.